Good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm calling for the rest of me. It's actually still morning. Um, I'm very happy uh, to introduce this next session here um, with really two very interesting papers um, on very, very topical issues, I would say. Uh, one is dealing with trust and monetary policy and the other one with managing the monetary policy normalization. And I mean, these are topics that are very much into the minds of central bankers in general, but uh, especially in the current environment. Um, and the first speaker who already has a kindly switch on his camera um, and who I'm very happy to introduce because he was my PhD supervisor, so I, I, I know him quite well, so I'm very happy to see him, uh, even if it's only remotely, is Paul de Grauwe. He's, uh, he's currently at the London School of Economics and he's presenting the paper on trust and monetary policy that he has written together with Yumi uh, uh, Ye, uh, also from the uh, London School of Economics. Um, so Paul, please go ahead. You have uh, half an hour for your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Isabel. It's a great pleasure uh, to be with you and uh, with your colleagues at the European Central Bank and, and all the people that attend this seminar. Uh, I'm very honored to be with you and I'm going to present uh, uh, results of research with it, um, you may G and, and myself. By the way, you may is not from the London School of Economics, but University College London, which is very close to LSE, as you may know. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about trust and monetary policy, and um, I call this a behavioral economic approach. So let me, by way of introduction, uh, tell you what I want to do. Uh, I want to analyze how trusts affect monetary policy, and I will use a behavioral macroeconomic model. Um, its main characteristics are that we assume agents to have cognitive limitations that prevent them from having rational expectations. They only understand small bits and pieces of the whole model, and as a result, use simple rules to guide their behavior. But um, there are no fools, and we introduce rationality through a selection mechanisms. And, and this selection mechanism allows these agents to evaluate the performance of the rule they are following, and they will decide uh, depending on their evaluation of the performance of these rules, to switch to those rules that perform better. So the first part of my um, presentation will be to present very briefly the model and then focus on trust, how we define trust, and what the implications are for monetary policy. And, and finally, I'll say a few things about uh, its relevance for today. So let me first talk about the basic structure of the model. So it's a very simple model in a way. It's a, a new Keynesian model. Um, it has an aggregate demand equation that uh, explains aggregate demand by a forward-looking component, that is the expected future output gap, um, and also the real interest rate. It's derived from uh, utility maximization. Then the second component is an aggregate supply, a new Keynesian Phillips curve that explains the inflation rate, and there again, there's a forward-looking component. Agents make a forecast about inflation, um, and that then affects um, the, the inflation rate observed today. And um, the output gap appears there as an exploratory variable. When there is a positive output gap, that will tend to stimulate inflation and vice versa. And then finally, the Taylor rule um, describes the behavior of the central bank that sets an inflation target, but also is concerned about stabilization of uh, the business cycle, of the output gap. So that's a very conventional basic structure of the model that you find in, in most microeconomic models uh, these days, at least the simplified versions of microeconomic models. Uh, what is um, less, whoops, just a second. Um, so, the originality of, of this paper, then, is um, to introduce um, behavioral assumptions about how agents make their forecasts. So instead of assuming rational expectations that we claim agents um, can not easily do because of cognitive limitations, they use heuristics, simple rules. And here we, we reduce the, the model to its bear um, simplicity, that is, we assume just two rules. One we call a fundamentalist rule, where agents forecast the output gap, 
to return to the steady state in the next period. We can have more complicated rules that we have experimented here with, but here we assume the simplest possible um, rule. And the second rule is an extrapolative one. Agents, according to that rule, agents extrapolate the past output gap. Note the following. In the fundamentalist rule, you have a negative feedback rule. Agents will tend to um, forecast the output gap to go back to equilibrium, right? So it's also a stabilizing rule, while the extrapolative rule um, is a positive feedback rule. And it is the interaction between these two types of rules that um, is responsible for the complex dynamics that will come out of this model. Um, something similar is done with inflation forecasting. Um, again, two forecasting rules. One we also call a fundamentalist rule, although it's a little bit different in nature. But here we 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 take the view that the, the fundamentalist rule is uh, the rule whereby agents use the announced inflation target of the central bank as their forecasting rule. In other words, these are agents who trust the central bank. They believe the central bank. And therefore, if the central bank announces an inflation target of 2%, they believe that in the next period, inflation will go back to 2%. Right? The extrapolative rule is then the, the other one that is just ex agents that extrapolate the past. So in a way, you can say that if a lot of agents use the extrapolative rule, they don't trust the central bank. So we will have here a way to uh, measure the degree of credibility and trust that agents can have in the central bank. Now, um, that, these are the only equations that I would show you. All the other equations I eliminated. But the market forecasts then are um, defined in, in the, the two equations that you see there. The, the market forecast of the output gap. Uh, is a weighted average of these two rules that I just talked about, the fundamentalist rule, where you see ETF, right, the fundamentalist rule, and the extrapolative, extrapolative rule, ETE. And um, these are the weighted averages, and the alphas are then the probabilities that agents will use either the fundamentalist rule or the extrapolative rule. And we have something similar for the inflation forecast, the market forecast is also a weighted average of these two rules where these beta are then the probabilities that agents choose um, the fundamentalist or extrapolative rule. We can also interpret these, these uh, alpha and betas as the fraction of agents that um, use these particular rules, right? And, and so these alphas and betas are determined by uh, the performance of the rules and agents are selecting the rules that forecast best. So they will, they will switch um, from one to the other rule when they find out that the one that they are using at a certain moment does worse than an alternative. And, and so that's the mechanism that will drive these alphas, right? We use um, discrete choice theory to derive these alphas, but I'm just giving you the intuition here. These alphas will uh, reflect um, how agents um, adjust the rules, depending on how well these rules have been doing. Let me quickly define a particular concept that plays a, an important role in this model. This is the concept of animal spirits. You remember what Keynes said about animal spirits. These are, in fact, uh, it's an index of market sentiments that we derive from um, these alphas that I just talked about. Uh, we can just transform these alphas into um, such an index of animal spirits, uh, which um, we call ST here, and that can vary between minus one and plus one, minus one will be a, a situation where agents, all agents expect a decline in the output gap. ST equal to one, all agents expect an increase in the output gap. In the first case, we will say pessimism prevails. All agents are pessimistic. Uh, when ST is equal to one, all agents are optimistic and it can vary between the extremes. For example, when it is zero, then there is neutral neutrality, optimists and pessimists tend to cancel each other out. So this um, is, is an important concept in, in our model to which I, I will return. We calibrate this model using numerical values 
of the parameters that we find in the literature. We do a lot of robustness tests that I have no time to, to talk about here. And we simulate it because it's a nonlinear, a highly nonlinear model using IID shocks. So there is no structure at all um, in, in the shocks in aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and the Taylor rule. It's all IID normally distributed with uh, standard deviation assumed to be 0.5, which calibrates the model to represent um, typically quarters, right? So what we, given the, the size of the shocks that we apply, we can interpret these time periods as being quarters. Um, let me just say in, in one minute what the, this model produces as results. So the, the key result of this model is that uh, it produces endogenous business cycles. So we don't have to rely on shocks to produce uh, dynamics of business cycles. Um, and the model predicts that a, a sequence of um, booms and busts that can occur in an unpredictable way, um, and, and there can also be periods of tranquility where very little happens, and all this is made possible by this dynamics of animal spirits that have self-fulfilling property. Um, optimism can um, start developing, that leads to a self-fulfilling um, process of um, act, 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 increasing economic activity that then leads to more optimism and, and leading to, to booms and busts. And as a result, also, we find in this model that the distribution of the output gap is, is non-Gaussian. It, it, it exhibit, exhibits excess kurtosis, but also fat tails. So there are, there are fat tails that, that occur and that uh, lead to deviations from normal distribution. I will also have the opportunity to come back to this. So let me now turn to the major topic uh, of this uh, paper, that is trust, right? How do we define trust here? And we, we have two dimensions to trust. Uh, one we call an institutional one. This is the trust in the central bank that has announced an inflation target. Do agents believe the central bank? Do they trust it? And actually, as I told you before, we have a measure of this trust in this beta FT. This is the, the fraction of agents that use the inflation target announced by the central bank as their forecasting rules. So these are agents who believe the central bank. They think the central bank is going to make sure that inflation goes back to 2% if that is the inflation target. And the fraction of agents that uh, use that as their forecasting rule is this beta F, and we will use that also as our measure of trust in the central bank. And the second dimension of, of trust um, is trust in the future, and, and here we will use this uh, index of animal spirits, right? uh, the ST that I uh, mentioned to you, that, that measures um, the degree of optimism and pessimism about the future economic activity. We can get into a situation where everybody has become optimistic right? and, and see the future to rosy and, and, and but this can turn around into pessimism and um, this uh, index st then will measure uh, this dimension of trust so the way we analyze the importance of trust um, is, is the following way um, we, we we apply shocks in particular we will focus mostly on supply shocks, as, as this seems to be um, a shock that, that has been important recently. Uh, and we also um, focus on big shocks. Um, by that, I, I mean shocks that uh, are really very large. I will come back to that, what I mean uh, practically. This will be contrasted very briefly with demand shocks, um, and I will also do some a sensitivity analysis uh, about the, the importance of the size of of the shocks so here it is uh, we i will present to you impulse responses to these supply shocks now this is non-linear model and therefore for um the the impulse responses uh, very much depend on the initial conditions ex the exact moment the shock is uh, introduced and, and in order to to illustrate this we will compute 1,000 impulse responses to a large supply shock that occurs at a particular point in time. But with each new impulse response we compute, 
we use a different realization of the stochastic shocks in the model. Remember, the stochastic shocks in the model are the stochastic shocks in the demand equation, the supply equation, and Taylor rule. So we, we run uh, 1,000 times different realizations of these um, stochastic shocks, and each time at the same point in time, we apply the, the shock, which is a very large one, uh, which is a 10 standard deviation shock. Now, you may say that's indeed very large. Yes, it is, but this corresponds to actually what we, we had um, in, in 2020 when the, with the pandemic and comes close also to what we had during the financial crisis of 2008 and um, 2000. And, and as Carmen earlier indicated, these shocks were indeed historically very large, right? Um, also, um, these impulse responses are express, expressed as multipliers. So let me sh now show you um, one of the major results here. This is an impulse response to a large negative supply shock, 10 standard deviation. So the supply shock occurs in period 100, right? So suddenly it occurs there in periods one, period 100. And what you see, the impulse responses, um, there was a great variety in, in these impulse responses. But the, the major uh, result that I want you to, to focus on is that there seem to be two trajectories, right? One, um, we have colored green. That's a, a, a good trajectory. And, and the black one is a bad trajectory. Um, and, and you can see that in, in the bad trajectory, the response of output is much more negative. And also it takes longer for output to go back to equilibrium. The same or something similar is true for inflation. For inflation, you can see that um, in the bad trajectory, um, the shock is higher and it takes longer for inflation to go back to equilibrium as compared to um, the, the green, the good trajectory. And finally, something similar happens with the interest rate. Note that in the bad trajectory, the central bank is actually increasing the interest rate much in a much stronger way than in the good trajectory. So these are the, the, the main features here. So um, a surprising bifurcation. The same shock occurs at the same time, but initial conditions are different and leading to two very different trajectories, right? But note also within each of these trajectories, a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of variation, right? It's not that you can predict perfectly, but, uh, but surely, um, there is this distinguishing feature of a bifurcation that can also be seen in the following way. In this, um, uh, in this figure, I show you um, the impulse responses 12 periods after the shock. So I've actually taken a cross section of the previous graph in period 12 after the, the shock, right? And then you obtain these impulse responses and you can see the bifurcation, right? There are two um, peaks there. So, uh, the, so you have, a, when you look at the histogram of the short-term output response, you have a concentration about um, around minus one, minus 1.2, and then a concentration much more benign about around minus 0 0.2. So you, you, you have this, you have this bifurcation, right, uh, that I talked about. And something similar occurs with inflation. In, in, the, um, in the bad trajectory, you have a lot of inflation, right? And in the good trajectory, inflation actually is, is, is around zero after 12 periods um, the, after the shock, right? And finally, it, something similar is to be seen with, with the interest rate. So that's another way to look at it. Um, but it, it tells you, uh, it, it allows you to see what the nature of the bifurcation is, right? So the question that, that arises, why do we get these bifurcations? What, what's underlying this, right? Um, and here this, the bad trajectory is characterized by the fact that immediately after the shock, we obtain a limit solution, right? That is, inflation credibility drops to zero, and atmospheres drop to minus one, extreme pessimism. And that means that the mean reverting processes, the negative feedback rule in the expectations formations are switched off and only the extrapolating dynamics 
the positive feedback rule is left over. So that's the fundamental reason. So you, so you have a very large shock that brings you to the limit solution, extreme pessimism, total loss of trust in the central bank. And as a result, the mean reverting forecasting rules have disappeared. And everybody is extrapolating. And this introduces a destabilizing dynamics that keeps the output gap low and inflation high. Now, how are these trajectories connected to our measures of trust, right? I've defined trust earlier. And um, so what I'm going to show you now is the evolution of my two measures of credibility. One is animal spirits, and the other one is the fraction of agents that um, believe the, the central bank, right? And since we run this model 1,000 times, we obtain 1,000 trajectories of these two variables. So here, here they are. Let's first concentrate on, on the black. This is, this, these are the, the, the measures of, of uh, trust in the bad trajectories. And, and look at the, the, the one on top here. Inflation credibility with um, shock, bad trajectory. Note that so up to period 100, nothing is happening. Uh, and, and you have this all black there because there are 1,000 uh, little lines that move up and down. Um, but then in period 100, you have this shock. And you can see that immediately or very soon after the shock, credibility, inflation credibility drops to zero. Nobody believes the central bank anymore. And it takes a while, you know, like 12 periods. In, uh, this is about three years for credibility to to, to, to re-emerge, right, where, where these become positive again, these, these fractions become positive again. And something similar occurs with animal spirits. Immediately after the shock, everybody becomes pessimistic, and it takes a long period for pessimism to disappear and optimism to emerge in the bad trajectory. In the good trajectory, the green ones, you don't see much, right, with some movement of animal spirits, uh, and, and also um, of, of credibility, but th there is not much, I mean, in terms of loss of credibility, most of the time, credibility, both in the central bank and um, some optimism is maintained. So that's the big difference between the two trajectories. In the bad trajectories, trust is lost, right? Um, and that's the characteristic feature of, of a bad trajectory, loss of trust in the central bank, loss of trust in the future of the economy. What is the role played by initial conditions in, in this model? Well, the initial conditions are key, right? So actually, this is the question of why do we get into bad trajectories in the first place, right? How does the economy get into a bad trajectory? And, and here the answer is, well, initial conditions must be bad. What are bad initial conditions? First, high inflation expectations. And second, low inflation, sorry, output expectations. So high inflation expectations means that agents expect inflation to be above the um, target of the central bank. And these bad initial conditions then make it possible for the large negative shock to push the, sim the system towards the limits of zero credibility and extreme pessimism. It is because initially you were already in a, in a bad state that the, this large shock quickly brings you to the limit and then uh, reinforces this and, and leads you in, into a bad trajectory. When, in, on the other hand, the initial conditions are favorable, that is, inflationary expectations are low, there is some optimism about the future, then the same negative shock um, will not bring you to the limits of the system. And as a result, mean reverting processes continue to do their work of softening the impact of the supply shock. And one then ends up in a good trajectory. So in other words, these initial conditions, favorable initial conditions, work as a buffer, preventing large shocks from hitting the boundaries and preventing a collapse of trust. Because it is initially because things look good, right? Then the negative supply shock, well, it doesn't push you all the way to the, the negative limits that the system then can end up in a good trajectory. And, and you can see that trust here is key in smoothly returning the economy to equilibrium in, if, 
in a good trajectory, trust is maintained, and therefore you go back to equilibrium faster um, and then in the bad trajectory. So that is the, 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 the key message that th these models give us. Let me quickly say a few things about negative demand shocks. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm not going to show you actually any impulse responses. We do that in, in our paper. Um, oh, by the way, before I, I go to the negative demand shock, let me say that in our paper, we also do much more precise analysis of how initial condis conditions can forecast the future trajectories, right? We, we do some econometrics and all that. To, to, to analyze this, and we do find that these initial conditions, especially the expected inflation, is a very good predictor of um, whether or not you will go into a good or bad trajectory in this model. Um, so negative demand shocks then, also large negative demand shock, um, we, we get a similar bimodal distribution, but much weaker. So there is not much difference between good and bad trajectory. Um, what is the explanation? Well, here it is. Uh, in contrast to a supply shock, a demand shock does not put the central bank in a dilemma situation. I don't have to tell you what that means, a dilemma situation, right? In a supply shock, the central bank is in a dilemma situation because raising the interest rate uh, will lower inflation at the cost of recession and vice versa if you want to uh, prevent um, a recession. When you have a demand shock, you don't have this dilemma uh, situation. And as a result, what the central bank is doing creates a signal um, that it, it, it can do something effective, right? It, by, by lowering the interest rate, for example, after a negative uh, demand shock, it works both in um, in, in raising inflation again and raising output again. And as a result, the central bank is seen as an institution that performs well, right? And, and trust is maintained. So there, there is very little decline in trust after a negative demand shock compared to a negative supply shock where the major problem is that trust can disappear. Um, okay. Quickly about sensitivity analysis, the, the, the size of the supply shocks, what I've shown you the result is when a supply shock has a standard deviation of 10. So what we do is to reduce the size of the supply shock. So you can look at this and, and move upwards and you can see that as the supply shock uh, becomes smaller, this bifurcation tends to disappear, right? There's still a lot of variation, right? Uh, and, and when you look at the, the second column of um, the, the impulse responses, the um, frequency distribution, you can see that th there is no normal distribution, um, certainly not when the supply shock is very big, that's the bottom one, um, but even when the supply shock is, is relatively small, um, you don't get anything near a, a normal distribution, which leads to problems. Uh, how do you, uh, about how, how, how to forecast right? the, 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 these impulse responses, the great uncertainty about all this. The power of output stabilization. Let me say a few things about um, output stabilization when you have a supply shock. Um, in the results that I've shown you, um, we set the output parameter in the Taylor rule equal to 0.5, which we call this the, the normal case, right? The, the Taylor rule with, with an output uh, parameter, which we call C2, equal to 0.5, seems to be also what central banks, uh, in, at least in econometric results that we have seen, uh, seem to have. So what, what we do now is to um, contrast impulse responses um, that we have shown you with a normal uh, C2 with one where we assume much stronger output stabilization. We said C2 equal to 2. And so it's a much stronger output stabilization. What does that do uh, to uh, these impulse responses after the same supply shock. And here's the contrast, right? On the right hand side, these are the results that I showed you earlier, which what we call normal output stabilization C2 equal to 0 0.5. When stabilization is very strong, when the central bank is very ambitious in uh, trying to stabilize output after negative supply shock, we can see that yes, um, output stabilization is very successful. Uh, it reduces the, the downward movement, and also it, 
it tends to reduce the, the difference between the good and the bad trajectory. There's still a good and a bad trajectory, but the difference between these two has declined uh, significantly, right? Uh, um, but there is a price to be paid for this success, not surprisingly. Um, here I, I show you the, if the impulse responses um, of inflation, right? On, on the right hand side, again, these are the results that I showed you earlier. And on the left hand side, I show you the impulse responses when stabilization is very strong, when C2 is equal to 2. And what you can see, the contrast here is that inflation gets ingrained. It takes a very long time for inflation to go down, right? It's like it becomes endemic in the system. Right? Um, both in the case of the good and bad trajectory, of course, it's even worse in the, in the bad trajectory, but also in the good trajectory, you can see that there are many green lines that, that take a long time to go back to equilibrium. There are some that, that do it fast also, right? You can still have, if you are lucky, if your initial conditions were um, good enough, you can still um, end up um, in, in a relatively benign trajectory, but the um, um, probability that this happens is relatively small. So this is the, the, what, what we find here. Uh, and then finally, what happens with trust under these two output stabilization rules on the right hand side, I show you the, the inflation credibility and animal spirits under normal stabilization. These are the results that I already showed you earlier. And now contrast this with what you obtain under strong stabilization. And the striking feature is that the loss of trust in the central bank is much longer, right? Look at this graph here, inflation credibility um, in, in the bad trajectory when you have strong stabilization, when the central bank is very ambitious in stabilizing output. Well, the loss is um, also immediate, but, but remains very low for a very long time. So trust is lost for a very long time. Um, and something similar occurred with, with animal spirits, right? Conclusion. So we conclude that negative supply shocks create important threats, threats to trust in a central bank and in the economy. All the more so when central banks pursue aggressive policies of output stabilization. This is much less the case with demand shocks for the reasons that uh, I've given you, right? Uh, which has to do um, with the fact that uh, when there is a negative demand shock, there is there's no uh, dilemma and therefore the central bank is perceived as being successful. With a supply shock, um, central banks are in a dilemma situation that prevents them from successfully destabilizing the economy. And if you then try harder, it only makes matters worse, right? So that, that's a key insight. Some relevance of our results. Let me conclude with that. Does, does all this have some relevance, right? Um, here it is. Uh, um, in, during the 1970s, we had large supply shocks. Um, so I will contrast the 1970s with the more recent COVID supply shock. Um, and in, when you look at the 1970s, there had already been a significant buildup of inflation and inflationary expectations when the supply shock occurred. In fact, this happened during the second half of the 1960s. And then our model predicts that given these unfavorable initial conditions, the recovery would take a long time. And this is exactly what happens in many countries um, that had a prior history of significant inflation, um, especially after the second oil shock of 79. It took a long time for the world economy to recover. This was not the case with the supply shock of 2020, which was preceded by a period of very low inflation and low inflationary expectation. And then our model predicts that the recovery had to be, could be quick, right? Um, and, and that's exactly what happened. It also allowed central banks that did not have to worry much about inflationary expectations um, to, to actually follow expansionary policies, right? And, and the recovery in 2021 was quite strong. But then unfortunately, a new shock occurred in 20. 22 and 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 here what what does our model tell us um, that's a final um not very uplifting thought for you um when the ukraine shock occurred the initial conditions have deteriorated significantly right and this creates the risk that 
we may be hitting a bad trajectory in the future um, with a strong decline in trust, high and lost la a long lasting inflation, a deep recession and central banks that are forced to increase interest rates to very high levels. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul, for this uh, very nice presentation. A bit uh, less uplifting message at the end, but uh, <laughs> this is the reality that we're facing. Um, the discussant of the paper is uh, Natasha Valla. Um, she's currently at CELSPO, but she's a very well-known face at the ECB. She was, of course, uh, working in the monetary policy department also at the ECB not so long ago. Please go ahead, Natasha. Thank you very much, Isabel, uh, and thanks for, for the invitation to this conference, which is close to my heart, I have to say. Uh, and, and I guess you know that. I, I don't know. I don't know if you, I'm, I'm sharing my slides now. Thanks for the opportunity to, 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 to comment the paper. And thanks, Paul, for the presentation. I have to say that after your talk, I see the paper a bit differently, but I still find it paradoxically quite refreshing, despite the gloominess of the charts that you showed us and the gloominess of your conclusions uh, and refreshing, refreshing why? Because uh, it's, it's another way, it's an alternative way relative to the usual um, uh, literature that we have in, in monetary economics in, uh, in generating endogenous business cycles and also that revisits in a sense, at least that's the way I see it, um, this view of sunspot equilibria and multiplicity of steady states and being careful about not to fall in the wrong one and why initial conditions uh, matter and how. So I think this is a, I mean, a, 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 a novel approach and, and I think it's a good start um, for, for, for a new trend in, in the literature. So I start with a very short uh, summary of what I think the originality is in this paper and then a couple of questions to which you may want to reply uh, if we have time or we can also uh, uh, let it uh, to the, the general discussion. Uh, so trust, as you said, is, a, is, is here at the center. It's a factor in the transmission of you comment mostly negative uh, supply and demand shocks. Uh, there are two levels of trust. One uh, uh, is uh, regarding the policymaker itself, and the second one regards the strength of the economy. And, uh, and the interesting thing, I'll come back to that, is that you have a, a bimodality in the outcomes, so that good and bad outcomes are possible as a response to those shocks, uh, in particular at the extremes. Um, there's a sort of endogeneity of trust because those betas are, uh, you know, the result of interactions. Uh, but there is an asymmetry in the relation between the outcomes and the dynamics of trust. So this asymmetry, this is where I have a, a couple of questions that are also related to this. What I tend to see, you know, being Bayesian, I see that it was more an absorbing state, which then for some miracle comes out of it again. Um, uh, but that's another way to think about it. Um, it's also a framework where initial conditions matter. I said it already, so there's no, uh, you know, unicity. You have past dependency in some sense. Uh, you don't need to worry because of the instability of the equilibrium steady states that we, the worry that we have usually in, in, in the frameworks where we have, uh, where, where we have those things uh, at the center of the, of the equilibria mechanism. Uh, this is a calibrated model, you said it, uh, but that's fine because uh, your model is helpful to derive stylized interpretations of, of, of outcomes that we see in, in real life. So my first question, but it's really a question de Béotien, I would say in French, because I'm not a behavioral economist. Um, it, is, it is more on, on how to compare uh, behavioral models apply to monetary policy, how to compare them with learning models, because it feels very much as your pool of extrapolative people are more towards adaptive learning, you know, and adaptive learning would be close to, you know, the cognitive limitations you highlight uh, in, 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 in your description. And your fundamentalists would be more the rational learners. At least that's the way I, I, I would see them. And that's interesting to draw the parallel because the one and the other, you know, families of models, learning models, have different implications for, uh, for, for policy action. Some tell you, you need to be cautious. You don't, you need to underreact to shocks. 
uh, the Brainerd uncertainty affects those outcomes, and others tell you you should experiment and you should be uh, bolder in your in your reaction. So I wonder if having a behavioral framework sort of sort of doesn't go either one step further and tells you it depends how on on how the blend of the population is. So I, I'd be happy to listen to you in 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 connecting those two those two literatures. Now. As you have specified, as the model is specified now, in particular with the Taylor rule, um, it cannot really account for uh, strategic interactions because the policymaker is not optimizing. But again, would there be a way without complexifying this framework to account for them? Because I feel it's quite important. I'll come back to that in particular in current circumstances where credibility and the dynamics of credibility, and that's at the core of your paper, perhaps very much depends on the initial conditions, but the initial conditions today are unique in history, at least in the history of central banking. Now, a, a second point I have a, a set of questions on the bimodal distribution of the impulse response functions. Uh, you, 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 you document a, a non-Gaussian output gap, you, you said it, and there's, and the, there's a bimodality in the responses of uh, output gaps and, and inflation, and also interest rates, actually. Um, so, I was wondering, and, and, and it really a, is a, a genuine question, because when we have models estimating the output gap, uh, there's not so much in the literature that looks for this by, by you know, for these uh, non-Gaussian uh, uh, properties, or at least that doesn't relate it to bimodal responses of the main variables. And I think it might be worth it. And the fact that you find those, and they seem to be very robust in your framework, uh, shouldn't we go back to those models? You know, I remember when I was at the ECB at the very beginning, Isabel, you might remember that, you know, the work of, of Proietti, Thomas Westerman was working on it as well. And at some point they were documenting those by, by, um, by modalities. And then we left that behind, but shouldn't we go, and go, go back to it? Open question. Um, and here, uh, it should probably be another slide really, but you, you try to be optimistic in your conclusions now in presenting, but I would be utterly pessimistic when I read your paper and when I compare your outcomes with the current circumstances. Because what you show, and this is this, you know, the draw line where you, you sort of drop in the, in, in, and takes a long time, 12 periods to perhaps come out of the state, I mean, I call it a state, it's not a state in your model, but out of the bad outcome again. Um, uh, so, so, so when you have those bifurcations, you fall in the trap where credibility is down to zero if there's a really bad shock. Um, but what if, and that's right, what you said at the very end of, of your talk, what if you have a, a sequence of really bad shocks, which is like what we ha are having right now. And the sequence of very, very bad shock is kind of compounding in the, you know, uh, low, up, or, or low output gap and high inflation configuration, then it sounds very difficult to believe that, uh, you know, with time memory goes off and, 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 and credibility comes back again, unless something happens on the side of, of, of the policymakers, either a strategy or a parameters in the reaction function. I understand this does not feature in your model because you have, and for good reasons, this uh, this rule, uh, but but it it sort of begs for this discussion at this point. So, given the asymmetry in the responses, uh, aren't we bound to be stuck in the bad outcome if we have a row of very negative shocks as we had? Uh, and what is the policy implication then? Uh, shouldn't we then overreact? And then I'm back to the sort of uh, 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 learning. Uh, prism of the, the learning the, the, to, to, to read the situation. Shouldn't we think about changes to the parameters of the reaction function? So that's, that would be useful to have a, a discussion on this. Um, on, on, yeah, that's, it's saying more or less the same thing. Isabel, you tell me how much time I still have. I only have a couple of slides left, but uh, if you give me another two, three minutes, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be happy. Um, so, you, there's one thing that is not really um, 
uh, formalized you, you 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 equate trust with credibility uh, but again there is this ambiguity trust with credibility and trust with optimism and confidence and i think here um it, it is key not to blur at least on the side of of the trust uh, that has to do with the policymaker ability to reach its objective, uh, not to mix this credibility and optimism interpretation of trust. I don't know if I'm clear on that, but I, I think uh, in other mod modeling approaches that would be uh, in the equation, here it is not, and, and those are two different, two different objects. Um, and the last thing really, uh, the relationship with the optimal policy literature. That's also a very tempting link that we would like to make and, and it would be useful for you to link, connect your results uh, with, with this. Um, in the current circumstances we also have, but that's, that's probably too far from what you're after, uh, the, the, the more specific question among supply side, side shocks of oil driven supply shocks, uh, because it was specified the, the supply shock as a, as a relative price shock, and, and that could be also interesting. Uh, but I think placing this, because it, this is also a very long tradition, this optimal policy literature uh, in relation to the shocks we see right now and the inflation environment that we have right now. So it would be useful to place it in, in, in this sort of, uh, in this tradition. There's one um, paper which I found relatively relevant to your, 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 your um, the question you ask in your paper. It's the, the, the paper in the IJCB, it's a, a bit old now, but uh, I think it's still valid of Berisville and uh, Camille Cornan uh, on, on transparency and communication. You know, what the optimal response to cost per shocks um, is and, and the fact that it may depend on, on, on the central bank communication and on disclosure. Uh, in their paper, both signs are possible, so you, you, you can really go both ways. Uh, and I think this link, um, this interpretation of trust and the ambiguity I saw in, on the side of the policymaker uh, trust, uh, trust towards the policymaker might also have to do with uh, communication, with openness and with disclosure of preferences. Um, initial conditions matter. Uh, as every economist, I, I, that's a very important point uh, because you have this path, this starting point dependency and probably also path dependency. Uh, and it would be useful to have the eco economic rational uh, uh, tweet. You have it. And, and in your presentations, you were very clear. So maybe I need to look again at the paper. Uh, but that's, that, that's also uh, important. It reminded me of, of, of the paper by Caballero uh, uh, that recently that looks at, uh, of, uh, at temporary supply shocks. So this is not, I understand this is not something you look at, the, you know, the, the, the persistence of shocks, but um, it, it's a good comparison point uh, on, 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 uh, on those initial conditions because they look at it again uh, as well. Uh, and I'm done, Isabel, thanks for your patience and I will stop uh, sharing this, the, the, the screen. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Natasha. There was uh, quite a number of questions and we have uh, limited time, but maybe I give uh, the chance to Paul to, to re react uh, to, to some of the questions. And I see meanwhile, if in the chat uh, questions come up from the audience, but uh, Paul, please go ahead. Thank you, Natasha, for your thoughtful comments. Um, I interpret many of these to be suggestions for um, further research. Um, and I think uh, you, you point out to some important issues um, that um, we may want to, to um, discuss and, and analyze and, and research in the future. Um, your first point, you, you ask us the question um, how to compare the, these learning models, adaptive learning. Huh? Our model is is a model of adaptive learning um, where agents try something, right? And, and uh, um, with, with rational learning. Um, um, so I interpret that to mean as the stat statistical learning, right? Where agents uh, um, use statistical methods to, uh, to, to learn. Um, so I, I, it's interesting to make a comparison, but one of the things that 
um, will make this comparison difficult is that we create a dynamics, right? When we systematically deviate from normality, right? And that makes it very difficult to implement statistical learning techniques, right? Because they are almost always based on um, normality assumptions, right? Um, another way to, to put this, when you look at these impulse responses that we generate there, yeah, the bimodality, um, this creates a, a fundamental problem of ambiguity. You have a shock, but uh, agents don't know what to do because the shock has ambiguity effect, yeah, ambiguous effects. Where shall we end up? Um, and that makes it difficult to apply statistical learning techniques, in my view. Um, and, and, and maybe the more rational approach then is to have adaptive learning, where you say, well, I don't understand the world um, sufficiently. And I, I, I observe that the world is not normally distributed. Maybe we have to rely on other learning methods. But here, I, I, I don't want to be dogmatic, you know, um, and if you can convince me that uh, we, we, should, we should use these um, other learning methods, that's, that's okay with me. Um, you, you asked the question, what about the sequence of bad shocks? Actually, we looked at that recently. We have now um, done simulation. We are preparing an, a new paper where we have a COVID Ukraine shock, we call it. Right? And yeah, that's bad news, I can tell you. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's not funny to look at these, these shocks. As you mentioned, right? you, you are quite pessimistic. Um, what, what might happen in a model when you have a sequence of bad shocks um, in, in that way. I take your point about trust. Um, in a way, we are a little bit loose about the definition of trust. We have two dimensions there. Um, one we call the credibility, optimism. You may quarrel about this, but we, we, we separate them. In our results, we always separate uh, credibility from um, the, the animal spirits, right? And they do not always go in the same direction. Um, that was not clear so much in the supply shock um, results that I showed you, but when we introduce demand shocks, right, the large demand shocks, then central banks have very little, very few problems with losing credibility. They maintain their credibility throughout, and the problem arises more than from the animal spirits, the market sentiments. If you have a very negative demand shock, right? And um, that can lead or can create um, lots of pessimism that is self-fulfilling and puts you into a bad trajectory um, while the central bank continues to maintain its credibility in terms of inflation uh, fighting. So we, we do make that distinction. It's not that we all put it together and it's mixed and, and no, we, we always take care of separating that. Um, your point about optimal policy literature and a connection with that, we, we haven't done that. Uh, also, I guess for, for the reason that I already discussed that this optimal policy literature is very much formulated in the context of a world where shocks are normally distributed. And that makes it easy to do optimal policy analysis, right? Once you depart from that, um, it's very difficult to, to design um, methods to, to do that because uh, of uh, the, the, the essential um, ambiguity, right? You have a shock and you don't know in real time initially, you don't know what the nature of that shock will be. Um, is that bad news or good news, right? Um, and, and actually, that's what we have seen with central banks. When the shock occurred, any central banks didn't know what to do. Uh, they, uh, should, should we worry about this? Uh, there are, in fact, there are two different scenarios possible, or maybe even more so. And that's what our model tells us. We have a large shock, and there are different scenarios possible. But in real time, when it happens, you don't know which scenario will actually come out of all this. And that creates 
um, ambiguity, making analysis of optimal policy is very difficult. But uh, Natasha, thanks you. Thank you for your comments. I very much like them. Uh, Paul, meanwhile, there were two questions also in the in the Q&A chat, so I will just uh, read them out for you. One comes from Matthias Farkas, who's from the ECB. Starts by thanking you for the excellent presentation. And he mentions you introduced two non-linearities, animal spirits and trust in the central bank. And he asks, should we not see four regimes? From the biomodality, it seems that the regimes are related. Does it mean that central bank credibility is susceptible to animal spirits and vice versa. So that's the first question. And the second question comes from Abhishek Das. Um, he also texted for the lovely talk. And he says, one of the crucial aspects of the adaptive learning that you were mentioning is, is understanding the network components or rather the interactions between the network components. However, when we understand uh, standing new shocks arise, these interactions are not necessarily quantified or largely identified very accurately on the system due to underlying factors. How should we approach using such models for policy decisions which could be harsher or less harsher depending on what our models tell us? So these are the two questions. And I, I had a question myself. I mean, we are with squeeze on time, but uh, followed a great presentation. And I was wondering also, I mean, trust is an unobserved variable in a way, right? But, uh, you know, we, we have surveys on, on trust and have you Right, looking at you know following certain shocks, whether we see in survey responses moves in trust that would actually corroborate what, what you find in your model. And another question, I mean, I guess it's maybe more for future work, is I mean, you know, sometimes we say once trust is lost, it's lost forever, and you, you don't really find that at your model, but as Natasha mentioned, it takes a long time to regain it. But you know, what can a policymaker do to, to regain the trust? And I think Natasha had something similar, like, you know, should should the responses be, for instance, more more um, rapid, uh, more um, stronger to certain uh, de developments, basically to regain trust? Or what should the policymaker actually do, or what can he do? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, yeah, on on the the interaction of that's that's a good question. Interaction of the the two dimensions of trust that we have looked at it in, in a very independent way, right? You have trust in the central bank and um, and, and animal spirits, um, market sentiments, optimism and pessimism, and, and they have a kind of a life of their own. Of course, there is an interaction in the dynamics of this, as you can see from um, the, the evolution of, of um, the, the these variables after the shock, right? They, they, they do interact with, it, with each other, but we we haven't really analyzed systematically the nature of that interaction. That's a good suggestion to 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 look into that. Um, on on the, the second question, network components. Um, of course, this is a very aggregative model, so I'm not sure I can say much about this um, because networks you 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 would actually have to go to a granular model, right? With um, where you have interactions between many agents and, and that, that have a network quality. Um, I think in agent-based models, um, that that is a more appropriate setup to, to analyze these questions that I don't think our model um, is capable um, of, of, of doing. And then Isabel, um, thanks for your comments on uh, service. Yeah, we have looked into um surveys and they, they exist uh, but we have not done any systematic work and 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 we do plan to do that um and and um and, and also on your last question what can policymakers do to regain trust when they have lost it so this is also a question that um, we are very much interested in and maybe i might suggest that the acb might be, be willing to sponsor some such research right? Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, Paul, for the great presentation, for Natasha, for the excellent discussion. It was great to see this, and it's definitely a food for thought for future work. I mean, trust is very important uh, for especially central banks, so we're always uh, interested to learn uh, more and understand uh, how, how this can change due to shocks and, and what can be done to mitigate it.